Welcome to Prakat's Global Accessibility Awareness Day 2021, an online webinar of inclusive design and accessibility information. My name is Ted Drake, and I'm the Global Accessibility and Inclusive Design Leader for Intuit. We make financial software that powers small businesses, taxes, and personal finance. The theme for today's event is to create inclusivity for all. To do this, we must recognize that every person is unique has specific requirements and preferences. Today, I'm gonna to talk about personalization and inclusive design. Raising the Floor was an ambitious program that started well, at least a decade ago. The goal was to push the burden of customizing the interface from the person to the application. Essentially, I would be able to use any software interface and it would adapt to my preferences as opposed to me having to figure out how this thing's gonna work. To make this happen, people would need to establish their preferences in a centralized location. And then software applications would need to access them and adapt their interfaces dynamically. It sounds pretty exciting. So let's see how that's happening. In the meantime, Apple excitedly announced iOS 7 with an exciting new feature. The screen came to life with a shifting perspective when moving the phone back and forth and up and down. The applications, the icons appeared to float below the surface of the glass. Even more exciting were these dynamic animations when the user swiped and selected apps. It was a practical cornucopia of animation and movement. But then we collectively discovered vestibular disorders and how animation design can make people sick. So Apple quickly introduced a setting to reduce motion. They realized that they had brought in something that was actually causing people to be sick. So they quickly modified and came up with a way for people to control the amount of animation appearing on their devices. App developers were then encouraged to detect that user preference and deliver alternative motion designs when requested. At the same time, web developers began using media queries, which are a method of modifying a web page appearance and behavior based on the browser's state. For instance, you can make a web page grow and you can make it collapse when I take the web page from a big browser window down to a little mobile screen. Now we can access the personal settings of our customers and we can make suitable modifications. So Apple first surfaced the reduced motion in their apps. Then they made it available for other app developers and Android did the same thing. So now what's happening is that that information is surfaced to the web browser. And now web application developers can make their changes based on those personal settings. At Intuit, we've built a function that surfaces the user preferences and surfaces it to the JavaScript and the React platform. That makes it easy for us to customize our animation library to provide two versions of our animations based on the user preferences. For example, we have a loading widget and that loading widget has a lot of grows really quickly and then it starts filling in the colors and it just goes zoom, zoom, zoom. You know, it's really exciting and vibrant. But for people that want reduced motion, they don't need the zoom, zoom, zoom. Instead, what we do is we provide them with the loading widget and it just slowly grows. It still gives you that feeling of the fact that this is loading. It just does it in a much more subtle fashion. So we're still using animation. We're still giving people the purpose of the animation, which is to say, you know, just take a moment. We're loading this page. We're doing some calculations. It'll be ready in about two seconds. But instead of making a zoom back and forth, we're just giving a nice, simple, steady animation. Currently, reduced motion is the best supported user preference. But there are more coming in the future. Web pages will be able to know when someone prefers light or dark mode. They prefer increased contrast and display, for instance, am I using a big monitor or am I using a, a screen that only has black and white or monochrome? Or maybe I'm not even using a screen. Maybe I'm in a car and the 
the data is being projected onto the windshield and input information. Can I use a mouse? Can I use a keyboard? Do I have to talk to it? Is it looking at my eyes blinking? Am I pressing with the finger? Am I swiping with the finger? There's a huge variety of inputs that we're going to start being able to understand. And when we know what's happening with the device, we can personalize the experience. Another example is if the battery is low, do we start reducing the amount of videos that we send? Um, if the ambient light is dark, uh, do we brighten the screen? If the device is moving, do we make buttons bigger? We can also personalize content based on the user's pro profile or the way they're moving through your application. For example, TurboTax provides a unique tax filing experience for every person thousands and thousands of ways of moving through the tax experience because the law is so complex. But as you're filling out your tax form, our machine learning and artificial intelligence is figuring out, okay, well, this person has filled in this information. These are the screens they're going to need. We're not going to make them go through 5,000 extra screens. We're only going to show the screens that are needed for their tax experience. And every time they fill out a new form, it's changing that experience and bringing in the forms that are appropriate. Another example at Intuit is QuickBooks, which is a complicated uh, accounting system, has two views. We just introduced a new view. It was based on how an accountant does bookkeeping. But now we're looking at, well, if I'm a small business owner and I just created a business, I'm not necessarily an accountant. So we have another view called uh, business view. And business view uses different terminology and a few different ways of setting up the page so that a small business owner that's busy doing all the work and the last thing they want to do is think about accounting terms, they have a much friendlier uh, experience. Now, we can do a lot with personalization. We have access and we will soon have access to even more personal settings and device settings and system states. But we need to take a moment to understand our responsibilities with personalization. Just because we can personalize an interface based on user interface information or state doesn't mean that we should. We can't make assumptions about a user's preference. For example, we shouldn't switch to a harsh, high contrast black and white scheme because a person prefers increased contact, contrast. They may want darker text so they can read it, but they may have a light sensitivity. And when all of a sudden they're uh, exposed to a large white screen, it may cause them to actually be painful um, because there's too much light coming in. So instead of assuming that because they want high contrast, they want high contrast, maybe start by replacing those light gray text with a dark gray text, um, increasing the font weight. Instead of using a light font weight, use a medium font weight. So start thinking about if I know the person wants higher contrast, then let's give them higher contrast. Let's not assume they want ultra high contrast. We can also risk violating our customer's privacy by using personal information that's not required. Leonie Watson describes why assistive technology detection is inappropriate. She wrote, my disability is personal to me, and I share that information at my discretion. Proponents of screen reader detection say it would be discretionary, but that's like choosing between plague and pestilence. Choosing between privacy and accessibility is no choice at all. That was in Leonie Watson's article, Thoughts on Screen Reader Detection. We also need to make sure we're not using information such as geolocation to predict a person's race, gender, or socioeconomic status, and then making biased adjustments. Raising the floor envisioned a world where everyone had a unique, inclusive experience. To get there, we needed personal settings. Surface those settings to applications, and designers had to envision how the product could adapt to the customer's unique needs. Personalized experiences reduce the cognitive load as workflows are simplified and eliminate irrelevant information. We also use personalization to prepare our products for future innovation, expecting new interfaces and challenges. A personalized design's goal 
is to give everyone a better experience. Incorporate significant user research and create a diverse team to work on personalization strategies. Don't sacrifice the experience of some customers by making assumptions based on limited data and interviews. Thank you for joining my talk on personalization and inclusive design. My name is Ted Drake with Intuit and have a great Global Accessibility Awareness Day.